some things that exist might not have existed, and there might have been things that don't in fact exist. How are we going to make sense of that in modal logic? Well, we're going to need variable domain semantics. Let's have a look how it works. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome back to The Attic. We've been talking about modal logic, we've gone through propositional modal logic, quantified modal logic, we've looked at constant domain semantics. In this video we're going to be talking about variable domain semantics for quantified modal logic. I'm going to be up front, this stuff does get a bit tricky, so make sure you watch the previous videos first, get confident with that stuff before you dive into this. If you're finding these videos useful, if you're finding them interesting, hit that subscribe button. So let's go back to the idea of a constant domain model. It's something that looks like this, where Every possible world has the same things in it. The domain of each world is the same. In this model, it's got A and B in each world. So a variable domain model is one that has potentially different things in each domain, or at least not exactly the same. So for instance, here's A and B, here's A, B and C, and here's just A. So a variable domain model is a model where each possible world doesn't need to have the same things in its domain. How do we set things up so that we have a variable domain model? Well, a constant domain model, we had four things. The worlds, the accessibility relation, one domain for all the worlds, and an interpretation function. So basically what we're going to need here is a different domain for each possible world. However, because there can be as many possible worlds as you like, we don't have to want to write down a different domain for each possible world. So we're going to have a function, a domain function that is going to dole out to each possible world a domain of its own. OK, so we're going to have two things in the official definition of a model. We're going to have one overall domain that is all of the things that we're talking about right throughout the model. And we're going to have a domain function. And this is the thing that dishes out a specific local domain for each possible world. OK, so I've used a D to write both of those. This is meant to be like a kind of a, a boldface D and that's just a regular D. It's going to be really easy to tell in context because we're always going to write something like this. D little subscript S, that is going to be the domain for possible world S. OK, so D is the function and DS, that is the domain of possible world S. So in a variable domain model, what we're allowing is that the output of this function can be different for different inputs. For different possible worlds, this function will give us a different output. So when we move from a constant domain model to a variable domain model, what else changes? Well, in fact, not a lot. The box, the diamond, they both mean the same thing. And or not, if then, if and only if, they mean the same thing but the quantifiers are going to change slightly. So in a constant domain model, here's how we gave the meaning for the existential quantifier. We said the existential quantifier is true in a model at a state just in case A is true at the same state in the variant model, which makes X pointer object O for some object in the domain, where that domain is the overall whole domain for the model. So when we move to a variable domain model, basically all we change is we require that object to be part of S's domain. So now we say that there is an XA is true just in case in the variant model, which makes X point to O, that's got to make A true at state S for some object that is in that world's domain. OK, O has to be in S's domain. And just the same for the universal quantifier, for all XA is going to be true in a model at a state S, just in case in the variant model where X points at object O, that's going to make A true at the same possible world S, and that's got to be the case for every object in the domain of that state. So it doesn't have to be true for all objects in the model at large, just for all of the objects in the domain of that state. So if we look back to the model that we started with, for everything is F, in this world to be true, all we need is A to be F. 
for everything is f to be true in that state, what we would need is a and b to be f. So the quantifier is local to the possible world that we're talking about. Even though in this model at large, we've got a, b and c, when we're quantifying, we're not quantifying over a, b and c in general. We're quantifying over a in this world. In this world, we're quantifying over a and b. And in this world, we're quantifying over all of them, A, B and C. So we've got these two kinds of models for quantified modal logic. The constant domain models, where the domain never changes from world to world. And we've got the variable domain models, where the domain might change as much as you like from world to world. It can be completely different in each world. There doesn't have to be any overlap. So these are like two extremes, but there are some intermediate versions, kinds of models where there are some links between worlds, okay? They can vary, but not totally vary. Let's look at those. First up, we have nested domains. So the idea in a nested domain model is this. If there's an arrow from S to T, okay, so T is accessible from S, then we want S's domain to sit inside, to be nested within T's domain. So in other words, all of the things here should also be things here. There might be more things here than here, or they might be the same, that, that's fine too, but there can't be things over here that don't exist over here. So when that's true, whenever there's an arrow between the worlds, then we say that's a nested domains model. And we can do it going the other way around as well. So we call that a shrinking domains model. When we've got an arrow from here to here, we want everything here to be over here. So in a shrinking domains model, we might take some stuff over here and lose it when we go to an accessible world. So there's going to be things here that might not appear over here, but we don't gain anything new. We can't have something that crops up here that wasn't in the original world. OK, again, the domains might be the same here and here, but they don't have to be. We might lose some things going from there to there, but we can't gain anything. So shrinking probably isn't quite the right word. What we really mean is not growing, not gaining anything, potentially losing something. OK, so that's what we mean by a shrinking domains model. OK, so there we have different classes of models. We've got constant domain, we've got shrinking domain, we've got nested domain and we've got variable domain. By and large, those different classes of models are independent of all the different systems of modal logic. So when we talked about KT and K45 and all that kind of business, there we're talking about conditions on the accessibility relation, whether it's reflexive or transitive or serial or whatever. Here, we're talking about restrictions on the domain function. Does the domain of two worlds have to be identical? Constant domain. Does it have to be a subset if they're related? Does it have to be a subset in the other direction if they're related? So that's nested and that's shrinking. Or does there have to be no relationship? That's variable domain. By and large, these two ways of looking at classes of models are independent. There is one link, and that is when we're looking at the symmetrical accessibility relation. OK, suppose we've got a shrinking domains model like this one, and suppose it's also a symmetrical accessibility relation. So this arrow has to be a two way arrow. Then if it's going to be shrinking from there to there, it's also got to be shrinking from there to there. So this would no longer be a shrinking domains model. OK, because it doesn't shrink going from there to there. Another way of putting that is, to have a shrinking domains model when you've got a symmetrical accessibility relation, it's also got to be a nested domains model. OK, so shrinking plus symmetrical gives you a nested model. And similarly, if you've got a nested model and it's a symmetrical accessibility relation, it's also got to be a shrinking domains model. So if we've got a model that's both nested and shrinking, does that mean it's a constant domain model? Well, not quite. All the worlds that are connected by the accessibility relation have to have the same domain. But there might be these other worlds over here which have no connection via the accessibility relation to any of the worlds over here. And these might have a different domain to these. OK, but when we've got worlds which are in any way connected by the accessibility relation in a symmetrical model, all of these have got to have the same domain as each other. All of these have got to have the same domain as each other, but maybe these and these can have a different domain. So even if a model is both nested and shrinking, it doesn't entail that it's a constant domain model. Let's see how these shrinking and nested domains models 
interact with the Barkin sentence. So, a couple of videos ago, we introduced the Barkin sentence and the converse Barkin sentence. These are important principles in quantified modal logic because they talk about how the modalities and the quantifiers interact. So, if you think about quantified modal logic as being made up of partly propositional modal logic with the box and diamond and partly first order logic with the quantifiers, we need to say something about how they're going to interact with each other, if they do interact at all. That's what the Barkin sentence and the converse Barkin sentence do. So we know that in constant domain semantics, both sentences are valid. In variable domain semantics, neither sentence is valid. What about in the nested and shrinking domain semantics? Let's have a look. So it turns out the Barkin sentence is going to be valid in shrinking domain models. If you've got a shrinking model, then the Barkin sentence is going to be true at every world. But it's not going to be true at every world in some nested models. And conversely, for the converse Barkin sentence, it's valid in nested domain models. If you've got a nested domain model, the converse Barkin sentence is going to be true at every world. But in a shrinking domains model, the converse Barkin sentence might be false at some of its worlds. OK, so it's not going to be valid in those models. Let's just have a look at why that is. OK, so we're going to be thinking about counter models to the Barkin sentence and the converse Barkin sentence. Here's a nested domain model. Just one accessibility relation. T is accessible from S. So the domain of S, just A, is nested inside the domain of T, A and B. OK, let's see what's true and what's not true there. Over in world S, everything is necessarily not F. Why is that? Because A is the only thing, so that's everything. And A is necessarily not F, because over here, A isn't F. So for all X, box, not F, that's true here. But the kind of bark and twist around of the modality and the quantifier, that's not true over here. Is it necessary that everything is not F? No, because there is this world over here that's accessible from here, and there is an F there. So here it's not true that everything is an F, something is F. So it's not necessary over here that everything isn't F. So the antecedent of the Barkin sentence is true, the consequent is false. That is a counterexample to the Barkin sentence. The Barkin sentence isn't true at world S, so it's not valid in nested models. Here's a shrinking domain model. This time we've got world S being accessible from world T. The arrow goes this way. So two things over here, just one of them here. A is the only thing that's F. So what's true over in this world? Well, necessarily, everything's F. Why? Because there's only one accessible world over here. And in this world, everything is F. Everything is just A. But it isn't true that everything over here is necessarily F. A is necessarily F, but B isn't. Because over here, B isn't an F. B isn't anything over at that world. So the antecedent of the converse Barkin sentence is true. The consequent is false. So we've got a counterexample to the converse Barkin sentence. T doesn't make it true. OK, so in shrinking domain models, the converse Barkin sentence isn't valid. OK, so the takeaway message there is Barkin sentence valid in shrinking models, not valid in nested models. Converse Barkin sentence valid in nested models, not valid in shrinking models. Both valid in constant domain semantics. But when we're looking at all of the variable domain models, neither of those sentences are going to be valid. OK, guys, so that is it for this video. And that is it for this series of videos on modal logic. I hope you found it interesting. If you're studying this stuff, I hope it's been useful for you. I'm going to be doing loads more videos on logic on this channel. So hit that subscribe button, hit the bell icon to get your updates. Thank you so much for all your comments. I'm really enjoying reading through them and answering them. If you've got questions on this stuff, drop me a comment below and I'm hoping to see you back here soon.